Two tickets, $28. Two hot dogs, two popcorns, and two sodas, $18. One autographed baseball, $45. Real conversation with 11-year-old son, priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. Except it all over, even Major League ballparks. So that MasterCard ad that you saw is from 17 years ago, and it was the very first of the priceless commercials that have become so familiar to us. You know, we've seen them all, blah, 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 this much, how much it costs, and then at the end, priceless. The Priceless campaign tapped into the cultural sensibilities of the time and of our times because it's an era of unprecedented wealth of an unending cornucopia of goods to buy and things to spend your money on. But even though it's a campaign for a credit card, they key in on what is missing in a consumer-driven world. These events where real connection is made, where human existence is laid bare, and we experience life as it is meant to be. And so these moments, this ad campaign says, are priceless. You can't buy them. These priceless moments, as life-giving as they are, seem few and far between. I don't know whether it's because you're so busy you just keep your head down and keep going. Or maybe it's because you're bombarded by images of that perfect life and you think, Yours doesn't quite measure up, so you just want to keep to yourselves, not share anything. Or maybe it's because you're enmeshed in this culture that distracts you with shiny things that amuse you but don't really feed you. Or maybe it's something far deeper than that. Maybe you've been rejected or shamed and you're afraid to show the real you. Regardless of the reason, our lives are filled with too few experiences of love and connection and too many moments of mindless entertainment and surfacy relationships. Although I must go on the record and admit that I am a big fan of mindless entertainment, so <laughs> Netflix is great. This problem is not new to our time because the same issues were happening back in Isaiah's day. The choices that the Hebrew people are making are steeped in their moment in history as much as ours are a symptom of our times. Isaiah as a book, I'm just going to give you a little history because it kind of helps to understand where we're at. Isaiah is written in three different time frames. And so the first part of the book, what we call Isaiah 1, is uh, written and collected around the time of the prophet Isaiah's life. There's other writers, but it's around his life. And this is about 200 years after what they call the golden years of Israel when David and Solomon were kings and all was well. And so by this time, they've strayed from the way of Yahweh. They've taken up with other gods and they ignore the teachings of their lives. And so Isaiah begins to preach at them, I would say, at them, because he has harsh words. He tells them that Israel's been unfaithful and that God has turned away from them and that they will lose their land and Jerusalem, and they will be carried away into captivity, which is exactly what happens sometimes later. And it's first by the Assyrians. The problem with where Israel is situated in the world is that it has been subject to superpowers overtaking it over and over and over again. That golden age of Israel was the one time where there was a power vacuum in the region, and so they were able to prosper. But after this, uh, the Assyrians come, and then Nebuchadnezzar comes after that. And Nebuchadnezzar in particular gets tired of their unwillingness to pay the taxes and to continue to insist that they have their own God and their own way of doing things. And so he carries away the people who are 
important, the people who run the government and the temple and all those who are needed in Israel to maintain a civil society, and those people end up in Babylon. And about 150 years after this prophet Isaiah was prophesying, Cyrus of Persia comes into power. He becomes the superpower of Persia in the region. And Cyrus is way more amenable to multiculturalism. And so the Israelites that have been in Babylon in captivity are given the opportunity to return to Jerusalem and rebuild. And so Second Isaiah, what we call Second Isaiah, is found in chapters 40 through 55. So the first part of Isaiah 1 through 39 is the original prophet. And this is much later. 150 years later, we get the writings of chapters 40 through 55. That's what we call Second Isaiah. And in Second Isaiah, they begin to write about how God has come back to them. How they can return to Jerusalem now and all will be well. This is where we find our text from today. Because though the people are still in exile, they are anticipating this joyous return to Jerusalem and to Israel. Or at least some of them are. Because others have gotten used to Babylon and they aren't quite sure that this is a good idea. And then just to finish off, we have 3rd Isaiah. It's a collection of people who write about 15 years later when things become a little more realistic. You know, they've been promised uh, a land flowing with milk and honey and everything's going to be great and everything's wonderful. And they continue in 3rd Isaiah with this exile and return and God's unending love. But the reality of the return, as you always know, the image is always better than the reality. Have you ever been on a holiday? I have booked apartments on Airbnb, and then I get there, New York City, not great. And I think, hmm, the picture, not quite what I expected. But then this is kind of what happens to them as they get back to Israel. Because it doesn't live up to the hope that they had anticipated. And so third Isaiah, it writes to encourage them to not give up hope and has guidelines with how they're going to restore Jerusalem. So that's the book of Isaiah. And our text today, as I said before, is like the very last chapter of 2nd Isaiah. So it's in the seam. It's in the place between this exile and their return to Jerusalem. And the difficulties are not placed on them by a ruler or a superpower this time. The problem that second Isaiah has is that these people who are in exile have become addicted to Babylon. So imagine you are they. You finally saved enough of your to have your own little house. And outside in the back is a vineyard with plump ripening grapes from which you are going to make the finest wine. And your daughter just married a man who is prominent in the government, and you have privileges that you never dreamed of. And your life is full of music and love. And sure, there are rumors of decline of this empire. It's going to happen, and of this Persian conqueror. But he said to be kind and will probably leave you alone anyway. And your only connection to Israel, to home and Jerusalem, is holidays and traditions. And if you think about it, sure, you suffer a little discrimination and maybe a tad bit of oppression. But why would you want to go back to this unknown place? This place that has been ravaged by one superpower after another. Why would you go back and begin this hard work of rebuilding? It's better to live your life as a second-class citizen in Babylon than to risk the return to Jerusalem and an unknown future. And this is Babylon thinking. Buy into this empire, don't rock the boat, be as comfortable as you can given the circumstances, don't ask for much, and you will survive and maybe in time even thrive. And you as one of the exiles who's made it begins to count the cost. What will I lose? What will I have to buy? 
What will I gain? And the reality for those people and for us too is, is if the reward is not priceless, then it's not worth it. Walter Brueggemann, who spoke at that San Antonio conference from which this talk came, and is an amazing theologian, he explains the problem for Isaiah 2, trying to get people back to Israel. Before there can be any geographical departure from this empire, there must be a liturgical, emotional, imaginative departure. And so second Isaiah and his community who have remained faithful to their roots continue to remind these people who are in exile, who have settled for a comfortable life, if not a compelling one. They remind them that there is so much more waiting for them if they just relinquish what they have and open their hands and their hearts to what could be. It's kind of an if you build it, they will come moment. Because second Isaiah reveals God to them again and reminds them that they are a covenant people who have promised to serve God and that God has promised provision and favor. God, the loving parent who will welcome them home and bring them a life that is full of meaning and purpose. So wonderful is this life that waits for them. They can't believe that anyone could reject God and God's plan for the future. This return to Yahweh, to Jerusalem, is not simply about a changed heart or a spiritual renewal. Because if you're going to return to Yahweh, to Second Isaiah, you have to embrace a new hope and a new history and a different way of living in all the areas of your life. And this is what I call Jerusalem thinking. And Second Isaiah puts it this way. I don't understand why you spend your money for things that don't nourish or you work so hard for what leaves you empty. Attend to me and eat what is good. Enjoy the richest, most delectable of things. Listen closely and come even closer. My words will give life for I will make a covenant with you that cannot be broken. A promise of my enduring presence and support like I gave to David. And I feel like this is the exact same conundrum that is put before you and me and our church and this culture. Why do you spend your money for things that don't nourish or work so hard for what leaves you empty? It's as if that MasterCard commercial said something like this, house, 1,200 per month, car, 25,000, expenses, 3,000 per month, life in the 21st century, mediocre. That's Babylon living. And so we ask, where is this priceless life that we long for? How would our lives be different is the question Isaiah asks, if we were vulnerable to the spirit and to each other in a way that is life-giving, that transforms these sacrifices that we all make into a rich and meaningful life that is not mediocre, but truly priceless. And Isaiah makes it clear that it begins with seeking after things that have substance instead of that which satisfies just for the moment, but leaves you quickly thirsty again. And if we're honest with ourselves, we know what those things are because MasterCard knows what those things are. 
They are the things which can't be bought, but which leave marks on our lives and help us to become our best selves. They are time with loved ones, spiritual communion with nature and with each other, conversations that go deeper than how you are, challenges that might appear to break us, but that we overcome through perseverance and faith. And it's working together to change injustice and the list goes on and on and on. We know what Jerusalem thinking and living looks like. We know that God is good. We believe we are people of the promise. But sometimes we forget that that promise is what we are called to live. And we stay in our Babylonian way of living and thinking where everything has a price. It's hard to trust, to be vulnerable to the spirit, to believe that letting go of the Babylon ways will truly lead to this Jerusalem life, to one that is priceless within God, who has promised us abundance and blessing. And it doesn't make sense to us because it seems naive. It's a different world, we say. And it's hard to trust that this is actually the truth. But this is what I know. It's exhausting living in Babylon. It's lonely and alienating so much of the time. And Jerusalem living is filled with expansive love that meets you where you are. And Jerusalem living encourages communities of faith that are there for each other. And Jerusalem living is wide-eyed, seeing the pain of the world and committing to easing suffering. And Jerusalem living is bold and vulnerable and scary and life-giving and freeing and submitting all at the same time. It doesn't make sense, but it's priceless. The Eternal One says, My intentions are not always yours, and I do not go about things as you do. For you will go out in joy and be led home in peace. And as you go into the land itself will break out into cheers, and the mountains and the hills will erupt in song, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Prickly thorns and nasty briars will give way to luxurious shade trees, sweet and good. And they'll remind you of the eternal one. And how God can be trusted absolutely and forever. Amen.